Hello and welcome to this week's program for the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. I'm Brett Shan, and I'm a member from Sydney, Australia, and I'll be the host today. Each week we connect with and hear from fascinating and inspirational speakers with a message focused on our interests in innovation, entrepreneurship and education. As a Rotary Club, we look for these, we look for ways these programs might foster new approaches to improving communities near and far. We're glad that you've joined us today and hope you'll enjoy how we are exploring how technology can serve the interests of service to others. Um, first of all, I'll introduce, I'll get some of our members on the call to introduce themselves, uh, and, and then Fahim will introduce our guest speaker today, Hazara. The Shags, take it away. Hi, Stephen Shagrin, better known as Shags. I'm in Walnut Creek, California, and I work as a coach <clears throat> helping people explore aspects of a relationship they may not think they have or know they have, and if they do know about it, they may not understand it. I'll be on mute because just to my left, your right, the landscaper next door is using his gas-powered blower, so the noise is definitely so, Looking forward to the presentation. Thanks, Shags. And then Fahim? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Fahim. I'm currently I'm doing my master's in reproductive biology at Osaka University in Japan. Um, so it's quite early in the morning here, but I'm super excited to be here. Um, and so, yeah, I'm finishing up my master's in the next few months and then heading back to the States. So, um, yes. So then for today's presentation, I wanted to um, introduce Zara Billo. Um, Zara is a, is a close family friend of mine, um, but she, more importantly, she's the executive director of the San Francisco Bay Area chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE for short. Um, so just to give a little bit of a background. Um, so in her work with CARE, so Zara is frequently seen at mosques and universities facilitating trainings and workshops as a part of CARE's grassroots efforts to empower the American Muslim community and build bridges with allies on civil rights issues. Um, she also provides direct legal services for victims of law enforcement targeting and Islamophobia. Um, her work has been highlighted in local and national media outlets, including the Christian Science Monitor, KTVU, MSNBC, NPR, and the San Jose Mercury News. Um, so for um, her presentation today, Zara is going to talk to us about the ongoing fight against Islamophobia. So Zara, please take it away. Thanks, Kareen, and, and really thanks to, to all of you in the Rotary Club for, um, for this opportunity to, to speak to the group. Um, it's on my list to visit Kareen in Japan before she finishes her master's, and I'm hoping I make it there, um, but not that she's away her master's on, on my behalf. Um, I'm excited to have this conversation, but also recognize that it is a really heavy subject. I'm also cognizant that I am somewhat of a Luddite around technology, so if I do something funny or look at the camera funny, I um, know that that's not because of anything that you did, but rather because I don't really know what I'm doing with all of these tech tools around me. So, jumping right into it, there is a, um, there's actually a video that I was gonna try to show all of you, and I'm wondering if it'll work. That, let's do this. We're gonna do here. Let's see if this works. I'm gonna share screen, and we're gonna turn up the volume. Can you all hear that? Is that working? Oh, see it, yeah. Yes. The sound isn't working? It's really low. Okay, so that told you, told you technology is not my thing, and I'm gonna stop. I can't. Yeah, uh, you're, you're. Oh, I'm back. Yes, yes. Yeah, you're okay now. Okay. So, you can't see the video. It is in the chat box. Um, hopefully, you'll look it up. It's, a, it's a, a small snippet of an interview on MSNBC yesterday. Some of you may be following the, the news out of um, the South in our country right now where um, a political official is being accused of um, sexual misconduct with minors. 
And the attorney for that official went on MSNBC and accused the um, Iranian Canadian TV host of possibly knowing something about sexual misconduct with minors based on the countries she's been to. It was really abhorrent and you know it was great to see the the other the co-host on the show step in and say, hey, like why are you asking him about his country? That's not the that's not the point of the conversation right now. I shared that video in a failed technology attempt to really start at a place of like what is Islamophobia and how does it manifest? So the word Islamophobia is a word that existed before 9-11. It was used in academic spaces, and you know we loosely define it as a closed-minded prejudice or bigotry against Islam and Muslims. And a couple of things about that definition. The first is closed-minded prejudice. You know, really looks at the question of double standards, right? Are we looking at child marriages in Saudi Arabia but not the United States? Are we looking at killings by Muslims but not by white supremacists? Are we looking at questions of rights and equality? under one standard, but not another standard. And so what we were really concerned about was double standards, right? Is that It's not to say that anyone who disagrees with Islam is an Islamophobe, but that someone who applies a double standard to the way they assess Islam and Muslims is potentially an Islamophobe. The other thing that I will say is missing in this definition is a lot of times Islamophobia impacts people outside of the Muslim community. So in our country, post 9-11, the first anti-Muslim hate crime was actually the murder of someone who is a Sikh American, because the people who are so ignorant that they would commit violence against one community are also so ignorant that they don't know the difference between various communities. Post 9-11 academics, you know, that academics like started to push that word into the mainstream as did activists. The question was, how do we talk about what's going on in a distinct way? And if every time I wanted to talk about anti-Muslim sentiment, I had to stop and say, close my prejudice against Islam and Muslims. Well, the conversation is already done and I'm out of time. I looked at words like anti-Semitism and homophobia as examples of powerful labels that describe sentiments in our country that we don't want, that we want to marginalize, that we want to make sure are not popularized so that everyone else can feel safe. We know today that if someone is called a homophobe or acts homophobically in the workplace, it could impact their job prospects. It could impact their ability to climb up the, the career ladder and the social ladder. And so we were thinking of how do we make sure that we treat Islamophobia the same way, right? The big picture being that we don't want to criminalize words, right? That criminalizing words has never been the objective at CARE. As a civil rights organization, we hold the First Amendment really dear. If we give the government the power to silence unpopular opinions, then when that government changes hands, that power doesn't go away. And so the example in thinking about recent administrations is that there are people who hated Barack Obama um, and, and so would not have wanted him the power to silence us. Same thing, there are people today who really dislike Donald Trump. Those people don't want to give any government the power to silence us, right? Because if we give it to the president that we like, then when the next president comes in, we still don't have, like we still have lost the ability to say what we want. And so for us, we're not trying to criminalize speech, even when we don't like it, even when we find it hateful. We want to marginalize it. We want to make it unpopular. So that's the word. Post 9-11, we saw hate crimes. We saw an increase in surveillance and profiling through things like the Patriot Act um, and secret wiretaps and those types of things. But many would say that even though we disagree with George W. Bush's policies, um, including his, his unending wars in Muslim-majority countries, that one of the really important things he did was that he kept the right wing at bay. There were no accusations that he was a secret Muslim. There were no accusations that he was sympathetic to Muslim people in the right saw him as one of their own, and his words attempted to mitigate any hate or bigotry. He was very clear post 9-11 in saying we are not at war with Islam and Muslims and very quickly visited mosques to assuage any fears and help manage concerns. Fast forward to 2008, and we got what many Americans thought was our first secret Muslim president. That unfortunately led to a rise in right-wing hate against the Muslim community because they were not ready to have a Muslim president, even though this one said he wasn't Muslim. And it also, by some standards, tempered what many expected would be really significant change by the Obama administration. Could we get him to visit a mosque sooner? Could we get him to speak out more vocally against hate crimes? He did a lot of really great things, like starting 
Muslim outreach efforts and hosting regular programs with Muslims in the White House. But it took him seven and a half years to visit a mosque. And many of the Bush era policies that were concerning and frightening for members of the Muslim community continued under the Obama administration. Fast forward to where we are today. The 2016 election cycle was probably one of the most vitriolic ones I have seen in my lifetime. And the targeting of the Muslim community interestingly happened from both sides of the aisle. So of course, very famously, Donald Trump said, I want to ban Muslims from coming into the United States. Ted Cruz said, we want to spy on Muslim neighborhoods. Ben Carson said he didn't want Muslims on his cabinet. So that was the Republican Party, and people picked on them a lot. But the Democratic Party also did something interesting, where every time they talked about the Muslim community, it was through a national security lens. We like Muslims because they are here to help us fight ISIS. And that, you know, like erases the actual values of the Muslim community, the history of the Muslim community being here since the slave trade and even before um, by some historical accounts. And so we were concerned that no matter who won the election, that the cleanup from the Islamophobia that happened in the election cycle would be really time consuming and it would take, you know, it would take a number of years to recover from what happened. Now, on November 8th, Donald Trump was elected, and you know, the impact of that, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, was the emboldening of, of hate groups across the country. This isn't to say like it was about that everyone who voted for Donald Trump was a racist. That's not the case necessarily, but it is true that in the 10 days that followed the election, over 700 hate crimes were documented by the Southern Poverty Law Center. They targeted women, undocumented individuals, um, Asian Americans, Black people, the LGBT community, and Muslims. And what we started to hear from members of the Muslim community is, I'm afraid of going outside. My family says I shouldn't go to the mosque, right? And I know that one like really sat with me for a long time because as, as an American-born civil rights activist, one of the things that I hold dear is the First Amendment, that there are people that migrated to the United States from Europe hundreds of years ago because they wanted a safe place to worship. And all of a sudden, in 2016 and 2017, we're seeing vandalisms happening at mosques and gurdwaras and black churches. We're also hearing from families. We're saying we're afraid to send our family members to two places of worship. We'd rather that they pray at home. Fast forward now to January of this year. And we got the first of three Muslim bans. So right now, we're actually on version three of the Muslim ban and version four if you include the refugee ban. That first one, which was signed on January 27th, targeted travelers from seven Muslim-majority countries, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Somalia, Libya, Sudan, and Yemen. And what it said was, if you're someone from one of these countries, you cannot come to the United States for 90 days. If you're a refugee from any country, you cannot come for 120 days. And if you're a refugee from Syria, then you cannot come indefinitely. It was effective the moment it was signed. And so, you know, think about getting on a plane to go to Australia and you think that you have the appropriate paperwork and you're all set. And then you land in Australia and you can't get off the plane or leave the airport because while you were in transit, the long flight, while you were in transit, the president there signed something that said people from America can no longer come into this country. So that's what happened. There were people across the country who were stuck at airports for six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. And in one case in California, we know of at least 30 hours where someone landed on Saturday morning and was not released until Sunday afternoon. So that's all depressing and heavy. And actually, let me tell you one other background fact. So we've seen multiple Muslim bans. We've seen the hate crimes following the elections. And actually, just this week, the FBI released its annual hate crimes report. And what they found was I would say two things that are surprising and, and yet not surprising, maybe concerning. Election years are notorious for an increase in hate crimes. No matter what the election, no matter who gets elected, hate crimes increase in election years. And so we're coming up on another election year in 2018. The other thing they found was that 2015 and 2016 was the first time in several years where we had a two-year consecutive increase in hate crimes. The groups that were targeted, are groups I've already mentioned, Muslims, LGBT individuals, Sikhs, Arabs, undocumented individuals, and, and more. And so we're concerned about people committing violence, and then we're also concerned about the state committing violence or state committing
and repression through things like the Muslim ban. Um, and when we're talking about other communities, we're thinking of deportations, we're thinking of mass incarceration and, and more. And so what is, what's the way forward, right? Like this is not a new phenomenon. The Muslim community is not the first community to experience this. Black communities, Chinese communities, Japanese American communities, the LGBT community, and more have experienced it and continue to experience it. And yet, we have to think of a way forward. For me, the question is, what is the America we want to build? What is the history that we want to be a part of? And in answering that question, I think of what happened the weekend that the first Muslim ban was done. Immediately, dozens of lawsuits were filed. Thousands of people went to airports to protest. And the activism didn't just end there. People reached out to their neighbors, their friends, um, different places of worship. They were cooking for each other. And it was through that collective effort that we won the fight against the first Muslim ban and have continued to win the fight against the Muslim ban. So what can all of you do? The first, I would say, is to study history and other communities, right? It's one thing for me to know about the Muslim community and what they're experiencing. But do I know what LGBT individuals, who by the way include Muslims, are experiencing, what Black people are experiencing, what doc undocumented people are experiencing? The more that I, I learn what is going on, how are my neighbors suffering, what are they afraid of, um, and what can I do to protect them, which is the next step, right? It's to step up and take action. And action can really vary. I was talking yesterday to someone who said, I really don't enjoy going to protest. And my response to that was, that's okay. And actually, this was be clear to give credit where credit is due. I affirm what she was saying because her next sentence was, but ask me, ask me for money, ask me to write a letter, ask me to go to a meeting and I will do any of those things. There isn't any single way in which activism needs to happen. It can be different based on your skill set, based on your resources, based on, on where you are. I don't, for example, expect Fahim in Japan to come to a protest at San Francisco International Airport and stand with us against the Muslim ban. But what I do hope is that she's you know, continuing to vote from abroad that she's writing to her elected officials and that she's hosting programs like this, right? So the first step is to learn about each other, to learn the stories we don't know and how we can help each other. And the second is to committing to taking action and acknowledging that everyone's action steps can be different, but that we need to commit to taking action in some way, shape, or form. And then the third is to make it a lifestyle. So Muslims pray five times a day, and one of the things that we learn about that is that I need to practice praying and I need to do it on a regular basis and I need to do it continuously to build a habit of it. The same is true for activism is that if I only you know write a letter to the editor once every five years then that's not a habit and that's not a lifestyle. If I don't know who my members of Congress are then why would they listen to me? And so what I urge people is to take that second step of taking action and make it a regular thing. We're no longer at a moment in time where we can sit on the sidelines. There are people in our communities, our neighbors, our friends, our family members, who depend on us to use our privilege, our education and experience, and our skill sets to take action so that we can do things like win the fight against the Muslim ban, pass a clean dream act, and really continue to stand up for each other. It won't matter who wins in 2018 or 2020, or 2022, unless we commit to working together, to work with our elected officials and to work with our communities to build the America and the history that we all wanna be part of. I will stop there, because I'm a lawyer, so all I do is run my mouth all the time, and I will continue if you let me, but I think we wanna leave some time for questions. Great, thanks very much, Zara. Um, I, I might pick off the question I have, and then I'll open up to the, the members of the episode as well. So you, you talked about change, but what we really need to change, I think, from, from what you're talking about, it sounds like both grassroots level change needs to happen, but also policy changes from, from the top level of government are required. So what, what needs to change and, and how far off do you think you are in achieving that change? So if I understand the question correctly, you're asking about the change that Fosters requires action, but I'm a believer that top-down policy changes are driven by the grassroots, right? So our responsibility isn't to hope that our elected officials will make change, it is to make them make the change, right? 
So that means that we get involved in elections. And I think that one of the things that young people, but also minority communities do is that we get involved in elections and we, we give money in election years and we'll get excited, but we will fall off or get complacent in the off years. And so, you know, using a personal example, I, um, I was really excited about Bernie's campaign. But I bought my airline tickets to go to D.C. to protest, even if he got elected. Like, I bought them before we knew, like, what the field would look like. Because I understood that if someone I wanted got elected, I would need to keep showing up to hold them to their promises. And if someone I didn't want got elected, I would need to protest. So I say that not to like say, hey, it was about one candidate or another candidate, but rather that grassroots change is what informs the rest of it. Some of my colleagues, some of my lawyer colleagues will um, use the example of Roe v. Wade, which is the, the famous Supreme Court decision in the United States that looked at the question of a woman's right to choose what happens if she gets pregnant and what she does with her body. And for pro-choice advocates, that decision was really advanced. Like it came, it was an exciting decision. It was a good decision. It gave women the right to choose what happened with their bodies. But it needed ongoing grassroots mobilization to support it. So most people don't realize this, but there is more anti-choice legislation, as we call it, introduced at a local and national level, even today, than anti-immigrant or anti-Muslim legislation, which is telling. Decades later, that fight is not done. And so even when we when we would say that the Supreme Court justices did what we wanted them to do, we still had to keep working. I don't know if that answers your question, but hopefully it gets at this idea that for, for me, revolution and, you know, and maybe if we're being more moderate, like gradual change requires all of us. And it requires that our neighbors and our friends, our churches, our mosques all be involved in that process. And that we move hearts and minds. And that's as, that's as important, if not more important, than moving laws. Thanks. Uh, Fahina Shags, any, any questions? Not so, so much a question, just a comment. I really honor and, and applaud your work, counselor. Uh, fellow law school graduate, but don't practice. Okay. And I'm a former recovering lawyer. lawyer. I'm sorry? We call them recovering, recovering lawyers. lawyers right? Yeah, I actually had two cases, both daughters, traffic tickets. But that's another story. I'm originally from Ohio, and I sat on the a group called the Jewish Community Relations Council. So, you know, the Jews have been dealing with all kinds of forever, forever too. It just comes back to two things, sayings. I, I love humanity. It's the people I hate <laughs> because they, 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 they just don't treat each other nice. Or I don't hate them. I just, it's people I can't stand because they don't treat each other nice. And then and you get them together and it comes down to politics, which is poly, the Greek word for many and ticks, which are blood-sucking vermin. <laughs> and so all we need to do is just get together with a group hug. And, and, I love and, that. and you can't, I'm going through something right now where there's a thread on Nextdoor dealing with comments when somebody sees some uh, a crime or a, something wrong being committed and they use a description. And people are getting all up in arms with the description. I said, people, you have senses. This is what we're doing. We're providing a description. It doesn't mean it's bigoted. It doesn't mean it's phobic. It doesn't mean it's racist. Because nobody's using that as a form of superiority. It's just a method of identification. Sure, we're all different. Look at a picture of yourself from 10 years ago. And you're different now. You probably wouldn't want to look like you do now. So at least I don't. So that's my two cents. And I, again, I just honor what you're doing. And I wish there was an answer apart from Rotary helping to bring us all together and say, there's no difference between us once you take the cover off. Right. Those are all, all great points. So thank you so much for sharing. You know, I, th there's something that comes to mind though that I'm, I'm struggling with and, and I'll, I'll share it because I, hopefully it's, it's something for, for folks to think about. We know that when people get to know each other personally, that that decreases hate and bigotry and fear. So if I, so I think it's like the statistic is over 70% of Americans have never met a Muslim uh, that they know of, right? And depending on what part of America we're in, we could trade out that statistic in a different minority group. There are a lot of Americans who don't know a Jewish person or who don't know a black person or an LGBT person and so on. And so getting to know people can decrease bigotry and decrease fear and I love that idea because I like the idea of bringing people together. 
but I'm also conflicted because I, I like to think that I shouldn't need to know a Jew to not be anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't need to know a Muslim to not be Islamophobic. And so I'm struggling with this. And, and I think it's a, a challenge for people to think about as we think about how we bring people together, is that we also have to teach people to, to love the stranger, to love the neighbor, right? And to love what they, what they don't know. And I think that that's, I think, even harder. So we, we and you and all of us have, have our work cut out for us. My grandfather used to say, every stranger is a friend you haven't yet met. I love it. That, that, that's beautiful. Yeah. May you rest in peace. Yes. Thanks, Jack. Uh, so, hey, do you have any questions? Yeah, um, I have one. So, I, my question, Zara, is what are some cases around the world of people combating Islamophobia? Because I know, you know, your presentation obviously is, is America specific um, since, you know, you're we're in, in the States. But like, do you have you heard of any cases like just around the world in other countries where people are, are having like campaigns against Islamophobia or the treatment of Muslims? That's a, a great question. I wish I could say that I had capacity to follow what happens internationally more closely. Um, I, I don't, and so my examples are, are general ones, but there's two that come to mind. I know, um, I forget if it was in Australia or somewhere in Europe where um, there was, there were some attacks on people on trains. And I remember that we got the hashtag, I will ride with you. And was, do you remember which country that was? Yeah, that was here in Australia. In, in Sydney, in fact. Perfect, right? Uh, and so it was like this thing where people were allies, were stepping up and saying, I will ride the train with you. And I remember, you know, there, there's something, like it's such, a, it's such a small action and it's such an important one, right? Like what I mean is it doesn't cost anyone any to ride the train with someone. They're not, like they're not in danger. Like the, the rider, the accompanier is not putting themselves in danger. Um, or anything of that sort, but what they're saying is, I will take this action to be with you so that you, as a person who feels unsafe on the train, who may not take the train if you didn't have accompaniment, know that you are are not alone. And it, it's like the kind of powerful action where if I do it for someone and I hashtag it, which is like very much like a like a, a young generational thing, right? But like my my generation would not would not have hashtagged it 15 years ago. But if I hashtag it, then I can also multiply the effect, right? So encourage other people to join and then encourage more uh, targeted people to know that they can be safe, right? So that's one, like one example that comes to mind for me. And then the other one has been sort of the movement world, well, not worldwide, but in a lot of places to welcome refugees, right? So some of what we've seen in different parts of the world, which isn't, Islamoph which isn't combating Islamophobia, except it's important to note that the majority of refugees in the world today, because of the ongoing wars and imperialism and, and all of that are actually Muslim. And so when people are welcoming refugees in the same way that when this country is attempting to bar refugees, it has an impact on Islamophobia. And I think we've seen some really great progress in Europe and elsewhere, not everywhere. I mean, Poland had a big like white supremacist march this past weekend, right? Um, but in Europe and elsewhere, we have seen places where things were welcoming refugees, and that's been really, I think, uh, moving. And it's been, sorry, it's been, it's a, it's been a two-way street. So we've seen people, for example, um, in Palestine and Syria sending messages of solidarity to like Black Lives Matter in the United States, um, and, and vice versa, right? So you, like, that's the power of social media, I would say. That's, yeah, great. Yeah, I like totally, I forgot about the ride the train. Yeah, that was a really, when I saw that, it was super sweet. So yeah, and, and, and to talk to your point about, about the, the vice versa, I, I think that's really cool how I feel like, you know, minority groups are really coming together. Um, and I, I really, I don't know, it's really, it's heartwarming, right? Because it's like, even though, you know, like, you, even though, like, that specific minority, you know, the other minority group, maybe I don't necessarily, like, you know, maybe, maybe even see eye to eye, or if I, if I don't necessarily, um, you know, identify with that community on, on a level of, like, my own identity, it's still the idea of, of coming together and being like, no, no, like, you're experiencing something really negative that we also experience, so just the idea of coming together and moving forward is, is really awesome, so I, I, I affirm it, I love it, I think it's great. Thanks. Um, might wrap up the Q&A there. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, everyone who's joined us today for doing so and encourage um, everyone who's enjoyed the program to let us know what you think. Um, below on our website, you'll find our discuss tool for sharing and responding to comments. So please take a moment to add to the conversation. 
For our members and Rotarian guests, please make sure you fill out the attendance section below too. It helps us know about the reach of our efforts and also say it serves as a makeup tool for a missed meeting. Uh, if you put your email address properly below, you'll get a message you can pass along to your club secretary knowing that you've attended our meeting. And as always, we'd like to give the final word to our speaker. So Zara, over to you. You know, one of my, one of my favorite things this year was, was being at an airport protest and being surrounded by thousands of people who were advocating for their friends and neighbors, but you know, they were also advocating for strangers, right? As, as Shag said earlier, people who had gotten off a plane from another country and, and saying, let them in. And when those people started to get hungry, something beautiful happened. Other people from all over the country started to send food to the airport. And so I share that in, in closing as a reminder that we all have opportunities to take action, that when we advocate for each other, we can indeed protect um, the strangers who become our friends. And that food um, makes us all happy. And so, you know, at the center of all of it is this idea of, of nurturing and, and protecting each other. Um, Listeners who want to learn more about our work or their civil rights can, can check us out at cair.com. Thank you all to thank you to all of you for having me. All right, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you all next week.